This video will accompany your notes in managerial finance class on the topics preferred stock and common stock, characteristics, and valuation. You know, we just completed a discussion of bonds and uh, we reminded you of three distinguishing features of debt and equity that uh, come into play here. Remember that debt is characterized by a finite term, equity by an infinite term. Debt provides a fixed return, whereas equity provides a variable return. And debt represents a first claim on income and assets, whereas equity represents a residual claim on income and assets. Well, preferred stock uh, fits in between uh, debt and common stock, has some features of both of those. Uh, we term it a hybrid security for that reason. Like debt, preferred stock is characterized by a fixed return, by priority of claim on income and assets above that of common equity. It also has no voting rights. Like equity, is characterized by no maturity date, an infinite term. Uh, dividends, a distribution of profits, are not guaranteed, so it doesn't pay interest, it pays dividends. Uh, and it has a priority of, cl of claim below that of true debt. Because the annual dividend is fixed and there's no maturity date, uh, preferred stock is valued as a perpetuity, which we've characterized as an annuity that never ends. And it's valued by this model here. It's a very simple model, really. It says that the uh, price, that is the market price, or the value, present value at time zero, is the annual cash flow divided by the required rate of return. Now, that's the very general model for the value of a perpetuity. Specifically, when we're dealing with preferred stock, we designate that annual cash flow as D. We know that to be the dividends. Uh, and uh, the required rate of return is characterized as KP. Um, so uh, it's uh, a few new terms, I suppose, of notation to become, uh, start becoming familiar with. But there's the basic valuation model. And then we can whip this uh, formula around to solve for the internal rate of return, or which we will also know or learn to be is the implied required rate of return. Notice here we're solving for k sub p. And uh, to solve for that, you simply divide the dividend amount by the uh, price of the stock. P sub 0 in this case is the current market price of the, of, the, of the stock. Let's look at an example. American Express preferred A shares are trading at 55 and a quarter and promise a dividend of $4.90 annually. Assume you've determined that the appropriate required rate of return for these shares to be 8.5%. And so we want to be able to evaluate that as an investment using both the present value approach and the internal rate of return approach. In the first case, we divide the dividend by the required rate of return and we get a value estimate of $57.65 and our evaluation, that is our statement of recommendation or conclusion based on our work, is that the present value exceeds the cost and therefore this is a good investment. Now we know looking at the internal rate of return uh, using the IRR approach, we're going to get the same result. This is a good investment. But here we're solving for the internal rate of return. And as you can see here, $4.90 divided by 55 and a quarter gives us 8.9%. Uh, and again, since this is uh, the internal rate of return is greater than the required rate of return, this is a good investment. Remember that these two approaches will always give you the same accept or reject uh, decision or uh, conclusions. So it's a fairly simple approach here uh, to uh, estimate the value or the internal rate of return of a share of preferred stock. The model itself is, is very simple. There are other common features of preferred stock. Uh, two of these, as we'll say, really inure to the benefit of the investor. Uh, the other, the, the last feature, really is to the benefit of the issuer of the uh, preferred stock. First of all is the cumulative feature. Now keep in mind, um, the board of directors is never required to, uh, or let's say under almost all circumstances, not required to declare a dividend on the common stock. If common stockholders don't like what the board of directors is doing, then they can simply uh, throw the bums out you know, and get some more uh, directors in there. But they are the owners, that is the shareholders, the owners of the corporation. And so uh, they can decide whether or not dividends are going to be paid through uh, their influence on the board of directors. 
Well, you can imagine maybe if preferred stockholders, they're not owners of the business, they don't vote, so it might be possible for the company to issue preferred shares and that, then not to pay preferred stock dividends. Uh, in order to protect themselves from that, most preferred stock is cumulative. What that means is any preferred stock dividends that are not paid, that is not declared in a given period, will in some sense accumulate. It's not a liability of the company as such, but it does uh, in fact appear in the notes to financial statements. If the company gets behind, uh, it's called an arrearage. And the cumulative feature simply means that um, before common stockholders can get any dividend at all, the preferred stock dividends must be paid both for the current year and any arrearage uh, before that happens. So, of course, that means that for the most part, companies are going to be, uh, corporations with preferred stock outstanding are going to try very hard to uh, stay current on those uh, preferred stock dividends. The convertibility feature is also uh, not unusual for preferred stock. It allows those stockholders to, by their choice, to exchange their preferred stock for a certain number of uh, uh, shares of another security. It's usually common stock. And so that gives the preferred stockholders, uh, let's say, the protection, the priority of claim that they have. But if the, uh, but if the company does particularly well, they may uh, be, prefer to be residual owners uh, in the company and to participate in that, uh, uh, that growth and those higher returns that go with owning the stock of a successful company. The call feature is a decision that's in the hands of the issuing company. It allows that company to buy back the preferred stock at some specified price. I say here prior to maturity, of course, there's no maturity uh, for preferred stock. It's issued in perpetuity, but what that means is they can require through the call feature, require the preferred stockholders or make the preferred stockholders uh, uh, surrender their stock uh, at a known price. Um, it's similar to a call feature on bonds, and it usually is going to occur when a uh, company wants to get out from under some uh, disagreeable uh, maybe terms or restrictions that are imposed by a bond indenture, uh, or maybe they want to get out from under the restrictions uh, involved with issuing preferred stock. But notice here those first two features really uh, serve to benefit and to put some measure of choice, uh, certainly with a convertibility feature, in the hands of the stockholders. The call feature, though, is a decision that's in the hands of the, uh, of the issuing company. Common stock. Common equity is the residual claim on the firm's income and assets. Uh, common stock is tough to value, and the reason it is is because they've got no promises of returns. You see, if you hold the debt of a company, if you own a company's bonds, that company has some legally binding uh, requirements that they uh, have, to, have to comply with, pay, making the interest payments on time, possibly setting aside some amount of money to buy the bonds back at maturity, maybe some restrictions on dividends or restrictions on types of investments that, that the company is allowed to make. Um, the, uh, but common stockholders, they've got no such promises. Uh, because equity is characterized by an infinite term, by a variable return, and by a residual claim on income and assets, uh, identifying the future cash flows and the required rate of return, actually I should say future cash flows and the internal rate of return uh, for stock is a tough thing to do. But we're going to take a stab at it by making some basic assumptions and estimates. Uh, to do so, we're going to use a, a model that's called the uh, Gordon model or the dividend valuation model, sometimes called the dividend growth valuation model. And although I don't, uh, wouldn't recommend you, you know, using this model based on what we're going to talk about to make any real decisions with regard to stock investments, let's just say that uh, there are a number of ways to approach stock valuation or at least stock selection. And this is very often the starting point. This is kind of the introduction to uh, stock valuation, and then you can, you know, you might be able to go from there. This is not an investments class, so I'm not going to try to get into um, any of the other uh, methods for selecting or evaluating uh, stocks. But anyway, let's uh, let's move ahead with this. This dividend valuation model. Uh, to do so, we uh, uh, to value common stock using this model, we're going to make some basic assumptions. First of all, dividends are the source of the stock's value. 
That is, the dividend stream represents the cash flows on which the stock's value is determined. Now, you might say, well, what about a stock like Under Armour that's never paid a dividend? Well, even a stock that's never paid a dividend may be expected to do so at some point in the future. We'll talk uh, in a few minutes about uh, growth and about dividend policy and how a company's dividend policy tends to mirror its uh, stages uh, in, in its growth cycle. But you can imagine that even a company now that's a growth company and not paying any dividends at some point will move into maturity. And at that point, typically, most companies will, will initiate a, a dividend uh, payment at some point. Well, anyway, if dividends are the source of value, we might imagine a, a, a valuation model or formula that looks like this, where the price of a share of stock today, P sub zero, is the discounted present value of those future dividends. Dividend in year one, dividend in year two, that's D1 and D2, all the way out as far as we can, uh, can see the foreseeable future uh, designated here by DN. Notice each of these uh, represents a present value of a lump sum. Bring that dividend, uh, period one dividend, back to time zero. Uh, discount that period two dividend back two periods to time zero, and so on. Uh, of course, you'd have to estimate the individual dividends from year to year, and that might be difficult to do. So we simplify and say that uh, we're going to assume that the earnings, which is the source of dividends, and therefore dividends and stock price grow at constant rate of G indefinitely. And we'll also assume that the required rate of return on common stock, K sub C, is used to discount this dividend stream. Again, note the notation here, G and K sub C. Well, the model that results is known as the Dividend Growth Valuation Model, or the Gordon Model, named after Myron Gordon, who was the author of this model sometime back in the 50s um, or 60s. Um, and it says that the price of a share of stock, the value is the next expected annual dividend divided by the excess of the required rate of return over the expected growth rate, or in notation, D1 over Kc minus G. Let's look at an example here. Examples are uh, Analysts are recommending that Toro common shares at $28, that's the market price. Most recent annual dividend was $0.95, cents, but you're not so sure about that. You want to do your own analysis. And so you agree with the analyst consensus growth estimates of 10% for the foreseeable future. And given a required rate of return of 14%, we'll use that PV approach to evaluate these, this investment. Well, first of all, we have to calculate D1. You see that $0.95, cents, that recently paid dividend, represents D0, we'll say. That's, it's in the past the very recent past, <laughs> but this model calls for you to, uh, in the numerator, for, to have D1. That's that next expected dividend, technically one year from now. And that amount is D0 times 1 plus the growth rate. We've got to hit, that, hit uh, the 95 cent past dividend with the growth of 10 percent. We get a dollar four and a half. And so here's then the formula for present value. D1 over Kc minus G gives us a dollar four dollar point zero four five divided by fourteen percent minus ten percent and that gives us a present value of twenty six dollars thirteen cents well that twenty six thirteen of course is less than the market price of twenty eight and so we would say that stock is is not a good investment it's worth less than it costs and we can also evaluate this investment by the internal rate of return approach. Remember that model that we whipped around to solve for K sub C? But now, solving for KC, we're going to use D1, same as uh, in the last problem. But P0 here represents the market price of $28. So solving for the IRR in this case, we can see that the expected dividend yield, 0.037, plus the expected growth of 10%, 0.10, gives us an internal rate of return of 13.7%. And that yields the same result, that is the same accept result, uh, reject result here. It says the IRR, 13.7%, is less than the RRR of 14%, so we don't invest. And we'll move to the next video.